So Sharzad is also a very long time activist. Her work spans a series of interlocking networks, including feminism, anti-imperialism, and Marxist theory and practice. She's done extensive empirical research in diasporic communities in Canada and Europe and conflict zones, including the Middle East. She's internationally known for her work on the impact of war, displacement, and violence, particularly as it impacts women's learning and education. Sharzad is professor in the Department of Leadership, Higher, education, Higher and Adult Education, and Women and Gender Studies at OISE at the University of Toronto, and she's co-edited a recent book called Educating from Marx, Race, Gender, and Learning. So please welcome Sharzad Good evening, and um, thank you so much for this taking me to places which I think that um, that's exactly where I would like to start my talk by some of the convergences and divergences of, of the experience that Meg was, was talking about in, in my own experience. And then also asking the question that uh, what happened to this knowledge and experience? And um, also, um, where are we now? What went wrong? Was it in the practice or was it in the theory? Or is it in, in, in both of them? And that's it, that is exactly what I would like to focus my presentation um, on, on, on that, um, addressing this, this question. Um, the invitation to take part in this important and ingenious idea of a um, coffee house style of uh, discussing anti-capitalism and feminism forced me to interrogate further my thinking about the desire for and the possibility um, of revolutionary feminist social transformation. In this thinking process, I thought it would be necessary to begin with a sort of a brief autobiographical note, a politicized one, the one that it is about my thinking and action, that is consciousness and praxis, and not a culturalized and socially constructed one, which is a dominant way of, of um, sort of um, looking at me and, 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 and defining my identity in the context of, of, of the um, Canada today. And that is usually as such thing as a visible minority, an immigrant woman, a Muslim, accented, and, and so on and, and so forth. So this will give you hopefully a better sense of why I am advocating a revolutionary feminist knowledge and practice and how I'm envisioning the Marxist feminist keywords project and key concepts, hence the title for this presentation, as an important intellectual and political path. Ismail Khoi, an Iranian poet, has beautifully, meaningfully, and, and metaphorically captured my experience of participating in the 1979 revolution in Iran when he writes, very, very briefly, but powerfully, the joy of a raindrop and the sorrow of it in a swamp. This reflects my experience of more than 30 years ago, joyfully and joyously watching the life-giving raindrop, the revolution, only to abruptly recognize its horrid fall into the abyss coming into power of the Islamic regime in Iran and the defeat of the revolution. After all these years, I'm still enchanted by the experience of the 1979 struggle for justice, freedom, and democracy, by its strong anti-imperialist stance, but equally haunted by its rapid demise. These contradictory thoughts, emotions, and remembering are exacerbated by the rise of Arab revolt, as well as teaching a new course entitled Women and Revolution in the Middle East. In many occasions, I've tried to share this experience, this exactly the drop, the raindrop, and, and the uh, 
the, the metaphor of the swamp. Uh, since the Arab Spring, with, with, with many um, of our comrades and colleagues and intellectual and younger generation activists, but always have faced a strong resistance and an eerie way, I, in an eerie way also, and this is this sort of a, um, um, in a way, the um, funny way the history repeats itself, and it was a lot of it was also in, in, in uh, Meg's presentation here as I was looking at these images and, and, and thinking um, and listening to her, that in an um, eerie way, I hear my own logic of more than 30 years ago, that is women's rights will be achieved with the coming into power of a democratic state. After, of when, when we have the revolution, we'll have it. And I see that exactly the logic that I was using more than 30 years ago, now I'm hearing from, from the, um, now the younger generation. So reading through a vast body of literature, theory, journalistic analysis, reports, and literary works, novels, fictions, poetry, and films from the Middle East, I've come to appreciate, and this is in preparation for my, the course that I'm teaching right now, I've come to appreciate more than ever before the continuities and discontinuities, the setbacks and achievement, the cautious yet audacious and reformist or revolutionaries of, of the, the experience of women that has been repeated, and, and, and also for more than a century long. Now, another autobiographical note. In the last two decades, I often have questioned myself, why post-structuralism, postmodernism, and other post positions have not fully grasped my ima imagination, have not been intrigued, I have not been intrigued by their possibilities or potentials. I've never been intimidated by their supposedly sophisticated explanations, never felt I needed to join the club or to develop the lexicon. Admittedly, there were moments that I doubted myself. As I was often told, my analysis is not nuanced enough, <laughs> or it is too simplistic, or it is too black and white, or too literal that it is always about capitalism and imperialism. <laughs> the years of my hesitation and trepidation were short-lived. With 9-11, the question of materiality and history took the center stage in some feminist circles. My limited knowledge of Marxism in the 1970s and the learning of it in the context of social movements made a huge intellectual impression on me. I could not let the ground, that is the objective reality, collapse, disappear from under my feet. I acknowledge that some of my learning and education of Marxism and feminism have been theoretically insufficient, inaccurate, inaccurate, not in depth or superficial. Nonetheless, I think that I had enough grasp of the Marxist, anti-racist, and critical feminist theories to save myself from the blitz of cultural and linguistic turn or shift. However, the theoretical issues raised by post-structuralist or post-modernist feminisms on the question of subject agency, on the primacy of ontology over epistemology, or the relationship between race, gender, and class begged and continue to beg responses. The question is, what theory is necessary to understand why feminist theory <coughs> in its all variation and strands, is still insufficient. This is what, what this is the sort of the core of, of my, my questions. So to respond to this question, let me start from the beginning of, of this movement. More than two centuries of women's struggle since the French Revolution, 1789, 
And since Mary Wollstonecraft's vindica vindication of the rights of, of women, 1792, confirms what Lenin said on March 8, 1920. I'm quoting. Lenin said, capitalism combines formal equality with economic and consequently social inequality. This is one of the principal features of capitalism and, and, that, and, and one that it is deliberately obscured by the supporters of the bourgeoisie, the liberals, and not understood by petty bourgeoisie Democrats. But even in the matter of formal equality, equality before the law, the equal, equal, the equality of the well-fed and the hungry and, and, and the hungry man, of the man of property and property less, and excuse this sexist language, capitalism cannot be consistent. And of the most glaring, glaring manifestation of this inconsistency is the inequality of men and women. Complete equality has not been granted even by the most progressive Republican and Democratic bourgeois states. The end of Lenin's code. I think that this insight is important, and I argue that more, uh, uh, today it is more important than when he mentioned that 93 years ago. We know, of course, that former or legal equality between the two genders is much more extensive today than it was about 100 years ago. Under the pressure of women's movements and, and, and other social movements, the capitalist state has surrendered more territory to women. However, the relationship between formal equality and social inequality has not changed. It is more elaborated, more sophisticated, and in fact, the equality is better managed. But inequality has not been eliminated. This should be the main framework of anti-capitalist feminism. That is, formal equal e equality reproduces gender, race, inequality outside the realm of law. This is because all social relations of capitalist society are organized on the basis of inequality of race and gender, that is on the basis of patriarchy, a system which produces male power and, and reproduces itself. The male power exercises its power through both violence and consent. And, and the consent is, is actually the form of the formal uh, equality that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and the violence is the inequality in social relations. The relationship between formal equality and social inequality has not been well understood, even among Marxists. Five years ago, Myself and a group of graduate students started a radical theory reading group to fill in the gap in our knowledge by reading and rereading some original feminist and Marxist texts and to enhance our philosophical and methodological grasp of dialectical historical materialism <laughs> with the hope that exactly to go to what Meg was, was uh, suggesting that not being surprised knowing that this body of, of knowledge and experience existed and, and we forgot to look at it. The new learning was culminated into a book project where we develop a new frame of analysis for Marxist feminism. And the book, as, as, as Abby mentioned, is, is entitled Educating from Marx, Race, Gender, and, and, and Learning. And my co-editor, Dr. Sarah Carpenter, is also among you. In this book, we've proposed a Marxist feminist framework that should have five theoretical components. A theory of the social, a theory of capitalist social relations and difference, a theory of knowledge, a theory of consciousness and learning, 
and a theory of social change. The end of our manuscript coincided with two important events, the Arab revolt and the occupation of, of, of the Capitol building by the working people of Wisconsin who <coughs> engaged in a struggle for their human rights, namely the right to collectively bargain as working people, which was also the impetus for the rise of the Occupy movement. In this writing, Sarah and I considered ourselves lucky, italicized, feminist scholars and activists to bear witness to the uprising of the people against oppressive political conditions and exploitative economic situations. We also concluded that any articulation of revolutionary pedagogy including one guided by the Marxist feminist framework, must have at its center, as its sort of scaffold, three dialectical moments. The dialectical relation of matter and consciousness, necessity and freedom, and essence and appearance. As we traveled inter uh, internationally, discussing the theoretical framework which we developed in our book project, we came to the conclusion that the time is right to develop a deeply connected and cooperative network of Marxist feminist research and scholarship with the hope to collectively articulate important feminist concepts through the analytics of dialectical historical materialism. <clears throat> and this is why that we started this project, the Keywords Project. The goal of, of this project is twofold. One aim is a careful re, uh, recording of the epistemological and methodological debates on formidable feminist ideas for social transformation. The second aim is to present a renewed Marxist feminist analysis of these debates. And ultimately, the keyword project is intended to present a theoretically enhanced analysis of feminism and Marxism, where both are fully cohered and integrated through the method of dialectical historical materialism. Some of the keywords that we are working on right, uh, right now are um, as follows. Revolution, state, democracy, labor power, class, capitalism, dispossessions, imperialism, sexuality, race, ideology, nature, production, reproduction, which is paid and paid also, work, uh, consciousness praxis, patriarchies, and, and nation and nationalism. What are our main points? One is, is that feminist theories, which see the regime of gender relations as a patriarchal system often do not theorize the dynamics of its production and reproduction of this patriarchal system. In Marxist theory, however, the state, patriarchy, and other social systems and, subsys and subsystems both produce and reproduce themselves. Patriarchy, for instance, produces male dominance and at the same time, as I mentioned before, reproduces itself. This interconnectedness of social institutions make it quite difficult to change them separately or um, independently. Bourgeois democratic revolutions had no project for em eliminating patriarchy and the recognition of legal equality of the two genders happened after two centuries of, of women's struggles. The two major socialist revolutions in Russia and China promptly attacked patriarchy and granted full legal equality. However, the capitalist patriarchal system morphed into patriarchal socialism. It continued to be present and reproduced itself in and outside of the state. And capitalism was able to reproduce itself and before long assume the state power. Second point, 
The main project of Marxist feminism is not to engage in a trade between class and gender. We will not break new grounds by a simple exchange or interchange of two theoretical commodities, class and gender. The, the debate of genderizing Marxism and class, bringing class, the notion of class into feminism. I think this project is, is it's not adequate. Feminist theorization is more diverse than its Marxist counterpart. However, there is a strong thread that ties feminist plurality together. Diversity is turned into uniformity in so far as they fail to treat patriarchy as a component of the socio-economic system as part of in a whole and as both dependent and independent and capable of reproducing itself across a space and time. The third point, we can surely move away from the problematization of women's emancipation as a question of rights and the regime of rights and equality and instead tread the so-called women's question as a major divide in world history, one that needs historical and materialist understanding. This requires a radical rupture with current theorization that is um, confusing essence with essentialism, structures with a structuralism, and universalism with totalitarianism. These preoccupations lag behind not only Marxism, but 18th century materialist thought. So I'm going to repeat as a sort of way of, of concluding some obvious statements. One is, is that, and this is uh, in particular addressing the question of, of, of the left and, 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 and the women's question. Production is not just production of material needs. It is also reproduction of life. The second point, gender-based oppression is not the consequence of the class oppression. Capitalism cannot reproduce itself without exploitation of race and gender. And the women question is not a bourgeois question. It is not a reformist question. An anti-capitalist feminism, I would like to propose, is a revolutionary project when it can go beyond the demands of formal equality at the same time that it struggles to achieve them, which will be women's liberation. But it is a project, it should be a project, that can liberate itself from the rule of patriarchy, but most importantly, emancipate humanity from the rule of capitalism. Therefore, it should be an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, and uh, anti, sorry, anti-colonialist, and against colonial feminism. Now, Marx has proposed four steps towards a revolutionary social transformation. I really think that an anti-capitalist feminist for, for our day should revisit these four steps and then try to change it in a sense that change it to feminist, revolutionary feminist social transformation. And then these four um, points or steps are as follows. One, to abolish all class distinctions. Second, to abolish all the production relations on which those class distinctions rest. Third, to abolish all the social relations that corresponds to those production relations. And fourth and lastly, to revolutionize all the ideas that corresponds to those social relations. Thank you. <laughs>